This video is brought to you by Storyblocks. Hey guys, it's Max. I just got two of the three Sony a7S III's that I purchased. I'm extremely excited to be able to use these cameras and have unlimited 4K 60 recording and no record limits, access to 4K 120, 10-bit, all of that. And these are the cameras that we're gonna be using going forward for a long while. And today, I'll be sharing with you guys all of my settings and my menu options for filmmaking with the Sony a7S III. I'll help you guys best set up your camera. And along with that, I'll be sharing what SD cards you should be buying. If you guys are like me, this is gonna save you over a thousand dollars because a lot of people are overspending on the SD cards. And there's only two settings that really require you to buy ultra fast cards or the new CF Express Type A. So that's gonna save you a ton of money. We'll also be talking about codecs and how you can get the best quality while still having a very easy time editing your footage and not having to make proxies and transcode. And finally, I'll be sharing my custom picture profile settings, the three different options that I am using to go from the type of videos that need to get cut quickly, you don't have time to grade, and it just needs to look great out of the box, to an option where you have a little bit more flexibility, but you still have a quick time grading. And then finally, when you have the time to really dive deep and make the footage look its best. Let's start out with the SD cards. And I think most people should be buying the Sony M with the little M like Max cards. These work for almost all of the settings and frame rates and options with this camera. They are very inexpensive. It's about 70 bucks for 128 gig and the read speed is 277 megabytes per second, meaning that your transfers are gonna be super quick. Now, my second suggested card is the Sony G cards or these SanDisks. These are V90 cards, and if you're gonna be shooting all I, we're gonna talk about codecs here in a second, you do wanna get one of these faster cards, and I would probably pick up one of them for that use case. Now, the last card, and what many people are pre-wording right now, are these CF Express type a cards, it's about 400 bucks for a 160 gigabyte card. Now people think that you should buy these because the camera can actually support two of them, but literally the only time you need this card is if you wanna shoot 4K, 120 frames per second in all I and using the slow and quick function. The slow and quick function gets that data rate even higher now on the a7S III, and it also removes the audio, so you don't have any audio there. Personally, I shot a bunch of 4K 120, a ton of it, and honestly, it looks fantastic, just as good as 4K 24. So unless you absolutely need to have an all I codec, you do not need that CF Express Type A card. Now I did some comparisons. Um, the one other time you might wanna buy that card is if you have to offload footage very quickly. And for 400 bucks, you can offload 128 gigs of footage in about three minutes but for most people, these M cards are a fantastic value. Now let's talk about codecs, and Sony gives us a ton of options, and I tested pretty much all of them out. You can shoot the standard H.264 8-bit, just like we had before, or now you can kick it up to 10-bit, but personally, unless you have a very old computer, I would not choose that option. The problem is, you still have that same 100 megabit per second, but now you're cramming 10-bit of color in there. This will edit easily, but you are gonna lose quality, and I would not select that option. If you have an old computer, then I would go to the SI 4K option. Now this, you do need a faster card, uh, but that's gonna give you an all I codec with a much higher bit rate, and then you'll have 422 10-bit. But for most people, what I would suggest is going to the HS option, and that is H.265. Now if you bought a computer within the last three years, all the processors and the graphics cards can now decode this, and you should have an easy time editing if you select the proper option. I would go into movie settings and then go into the record setting and you can have 10 bit with two options. You can have 420 or 422. Now everybody wants 422, that's what the new Canon R5 has, but it is a pain to edit because no computers have decoders for that. I would select the 420 10 bit option. That gives you 10 bit color, but modern computers can actually very easily handle this footage. And that's why Fujifilm is going with this a codec option, uh, Panasonic is going with this codec option. They don't even give you the option for 422. This compression method is much more efficient. So you're actually getting twice the quality 
at the same size. Along with that, I found that for low light footage, this option actually looked the best because it's a perfect blend between the compression algorithm, the file size, and how much color information is trying to be crammed in there. And even the all eye codec, it actually looks worse because it's a much less efficient compression. Now, before we move on to the menu settings, customization, and picture profiles, let me tell you about a super helpful video editing tool, our sponsor, Storyblocks. Many of us find that the YouTube and social media videos or even commercial videos that we make can use just that extra something, but once we're done shooting, we often have to settle for what we have. Well, that's where Storyblocks comes in with over 1 million assets, including HD and 4K footage, music and images, and even After Effects templates and motion backgrounds. New media is regularly added and everything is royalty free for one low subscription price. Go to storyblocks.com slash max to learn more. And the next time you're in a bind or just want to make your video better, you'll have access to a huge stock library at a fraction of the cost. Take your video to the next level with Storyblocks. Let's start out with my custom picture profiles before I show you how I set up the my menu, the function menu, all the little buttons that are customizable to have a really nice efficient efficient workflow. So out of the gate, you get picture profile off. I would not use that. The highlights end up being lost. You can't really pull stuff back very much. Details are crushed. The first profile out of the three that I consistently use, and there's gonna be one more that I'm gonna add, is picture profile one. Now I do make a couple different tweaks. I bring the black level up to plus two. And then I also bring down the saturation by minus two. And the last one is detail also to minus two. So basically what that does is some of the shadows are kind of lost some details. It brings the blacks up just a little bit. The saturation is brought down just a tiny bit. And I think it's kind of over sharpened out of the box. It's also brought down just a tiny bit. Still looks great. And this is what I use for videos like this, what you guys are seeing me right now. When I need to be able to not have to color grade or adjust anything, just cut, get a project done done and out or delivered footage to somebody, this is a great profile. The other benefit is there is about 9% of highlight retention. So if you blow something out, you have some room to pull it back and recover highlights, which is very handy. The second profile that I like to use is Picture Profile 6 based off of Cine 2. Now this is great for a nice natural look, something that looks a little bit flatter than the Picture Profile 1. You can grade this further, you can send it off to somebody and they can tweak colors just a little bit. You can use one a LUT on there just to make maybe it look a little bit more film-like. Now in here, I did make a couple tweaks. I brought the black level down to negative 10, adding a little bit of contrast, saturation positive, plus 10 here, a little bit of saturation. And then in the detail, I kicked it up by two, just adding a little bit of sharpening. Now this gives you a nice look, something that looks a little more cinematic, if you wanna call it that. Uh, and it actually has better dynamic range as well compared to picture profile one. The only thing is here, you do have to be careful with your highlights because anything above 100 does end up clipping, so be careful. The third one that I'm using is S-Log. Now I used to use S-Log 2 because the 8-bit codec would fall apart with S-Log 3, look terrible. Now we're gonna be using S-Log 3 because the 10-bit codec and the dynamic range is excellent. Now I did make a couple customizations. I'm using both picture profile eight and nine. One is for lower light situations, one is for bright situations. Now out of the box, this will default to S gamut three without the cine. Um, so I switch both to cine because it's a little bit easier to work with the colors with that. And then for one of these, I'll go into detail and I dropped this and defaults to negative seven, so very little sharpening. I kicked it up to negative three for the daylight option because I always add it in post anyways. And for a lot of cameras, you don't wanna do that because you'll see extra noise. For daylight footage with the A7S III, the low light performance or the noise performance is very good, very little noise. So I'd rather just kick up a little bit of sharpening, not a ton, baked into the file so I don't have to do that later. But if I'm shooting in low light, then in this situation, I make sure that it's set to negative seven out of the box because if you're gonna to wanna to denoise later, you don't want that sharpening there. Now, the last profile that I'm not using yet, but I'm going to is I'm gonna use HLG for HDR. Dynamic range is great. It does have color and contrast. Now, I'm gonna be switching this to HL, HLG3 based on Gerald and Dunn's suggestions. 
Um, so this is gonna be for HDR, and I'm gonna be exploring that way more now that we have a nice 10-bit codec here. Now let's jump into the menus. I'm gonna be going quick. I'll be skipping over some things that I just don't use or don't touch, and then I'll show you how I customize the camera. We're gonna start out with the file format. As I mentioned, I like the HS because it's a great blend between quality, um, color compression, you have 10-bit options, um, and the file sizes are small, and then as long as you go into the movie settings here and you select 420, you're gonna have a much easier time instead of 422. I use 100 for most things, but if you're shooting an interview and somebody's just sitting there and they're not moving around much, you can drop that down to 50 or even 30 because remember, with H.265, which is what this is, your quality is just as good using half the file space. So you can double this if you're going off of H.264 bit rates. Slow and quick settings, I rarely use this because I like my audio to be there even for 4K 120 frames per second. But in here, you can select whatever you want. Proxies, if you have a slow computer, we have that ability to write two files. You can connect, edit off the 1080p, and then you can reconnect the 4K. I don't use that because I like having a good computer. Let's go down here. For my media settings, usually I keep it just set to standard, meaning it'll use one card, and then I have it auto switch to the other one, which is great if you're doing things like weddings or interviews, your card fills up. Now, you can go in, you have dual card slots, and go to simultaneous, so it's gonna record the same file to both. So I would only use that for very important things, you're duplicating the files, uh, but that is great to have. Here's a feature that is fantastic with these new cameras, I'm gonna go into file settings and here you can customize if you want it to go in a series, if you want to reset the timer because sometimes you have multiple cameras, they all start with the same uh, file number. At times I had five Sonys and it's such a pain syncing stuff up. So you can actually go in here. The, the coolest thing is you can actually just set the title name so you can have A camera, B camera, C camera um, and that just makes it so helpful if you're doing multicam. Let's jump into the audio recording modes. So we wanna record audio. As far as levels, I typically keep it at about 25 to standard if I'm recording externally, which I almost always am. And then if you're using something like the Rode Video Mic Go, I typically have it set to about six, um, and then that gives you a nice middle ground where you still have some control, and then for that, I'll leave it in the kind of the, the medium gain setting. And then one thing I like to do is turn the wind noise reduction off. It might sound like a good idea to reduce that, but it's doing it electronically, and sometimes you get this terrible kind of sound. And then audio level display, I have a shortcut for this, but I'll go ahead and turn that on if you wanna monitor audio, if you're gonna be recording internally. Jumping down to image stabilization, with this camera, I'm using active. So typically I'll flip between off or standard. Active actually crops a little bit. It doesn't crop into your 4K video because the sensor is actually slightly higher than 4K. It definitely helps out with the stabilization and thankfully, you don't get any weird wobbliness or anything like that. So I would definitely use active. Now if you wanna use the gyro setting um, later and then you wanna stabilize in post using Sony software, you wanna turn this off and make sure your lens stabilization is off as well. Let's go into the zoom setting and this is actually something I do use. I only use the clear image zoom. I don't have a lens that can zoom so that would be the optical setting and clear image zoom will actually digitally crop into the 4k video and then upsample it and still keep it 4k. So it's kind of fake zooming and it might sound like you'd never want to use this but it can be handy. Um, I would only use it in good lighting situations with low ISOs then it can actually look pretty good and with this camera specifically you can't use APS-C crop in 4K because it's a 4K sensor, but you can still use clear image zoom. And I'll show you where I map that in just a bit. Now, as far as the shooting display, um, I don't usually use grids, that's more for photos. The next one I actually use is the marker display. There's two things that are handy here, and I map these as well. So the first is aspect marker. So if you're gonna be shooting for a wider aspect ratio or even a square one, you can go through and adjust it here and then you'll get some lines. I can't show you that because I'm recording externally right now and it's not showing up. Uh, the next one is the safety zone, 80% or 90. Basically just shows you a box in your image and 90% is very useful if you're gonna be shooting for the web and you want to make sure that nothing gets cropped out. If people with widescreen phones end up zooming in on your video, 90% is really
really good for say iPhones and your typical ones and some of the even wider ones um, like the Sony phones are super wide, you can use 80%. The next thing I change is in the metering section. Here, there's a couple different things. So metering, obviously you change if you wanna see how your exposure is, but I like having face priority in multi-metering on. So if you're using the multi, which is this one right here, um, it will actually see people's faces and show you the exposure for their faces. So if I'm shooting people, I wanna expose for them. So I keep that on and then for spot metering, um, you can change it so that it'll move around with your focus point, which is great because if I wanna see if something's too uh, overexposed or an S-log, I wanna make sure that a certain area of the frame is two stops overexposed, it's great to be able to move that focus point around. Moving down to white balance, there are a couple things that I change. First off, priority in auto white balance, I use standard, and yes, I do use auto white balance sometimes if I'm shooting run and gun moving from inside to outside. I use the standard or I use the ambience mode. Now the ambience mode will try to match the room. So if you're shooting a wedding, it's low light, there's lots of warm lighting, this will match the environment. It won't make it too cool and fake looking because the camera's trying to correct for that. You don't want that. And then there's a white mode, and I never use that, but if you want whites to look pure white and you want it to just force everything uh, to look like it's normal <laughs> outside, you could use that, but I don't. Now, the shockless white balance is also great. I would keep it at two. This makes it so that in auto white balance, instead of quickly just changing abruptly and being horrible, it will smoothly adjust. And so you could use either three for slow or two. I wouldn't do fast. And it just makes auto white balance for continuous recording so much better. Here we get into the picture profiles. Um, I do not use dynamic range optimization. If you use a picture profile, it won't work anyways. Creative looks, I also don't use those. And there's some different colors and um, there's black and white and stuff like that. I don't use that keep it at standard, and the picture profiles we already went over. And for zebras, I definitely use zebras. I keep them on pretty much all the time, and I love using the zebra level 100 plus, in at least in standard picture profiles, which I use probably 90% of the time. We'll see with the a7S III, uh, what ends up happening, how often I use S-Log3, but I wanna see everything that is blowing out. So I would use spot metering or multi-metering for my exposure, and then I wanna see what's blowing out. So if I see a huge wall that's blown out because it's window lighting coming in or the sky is way too overexposed, that gives me, just at a glance, I can see what I should expose. If I need to bring it down a little bit and then bump it up in post, which of course with the 10-bit isn't gonna have an issue. Now, focusing mode, um, I do use continuous autofocus and I did tweak a little bit, I'll show you guys. As far as the transition speed and sensitivity, this is my default. I like to have it right in the middle but sensitivity with this camera specifically, and especially with some of the Tamron lenses, I like it to be a little bit more responsive because I find it to be a little bit slow. And then let's go into the focus area. Um, so I switch it depending on what I'm doing. Um, I like to have the wide, which the camera will look at faces for face tracking. If I want to limit it, say there's a crowd and I'm shooting bride walking down the aisle, I still want it to find her, but I want to ignore the side. So in this mode, you guys see the box that moves around. That is really nice and handy to use. And then I don't really use center, and then I use my spot metering depending on the size or the spot mode, which also adjusts the metering. And then let's see, what else do I change here? Now for face autofocus and eye autofocus, which you could do in video now, this is super nice and handy. I do keep it on a lot of the time. I have it kept set to human here, and I don't care about which eye as long as the face is in focus. I do wanna see the face, so this is gonna frame the face, that the faces that are there and what it's focusing on and then the ability to uh, prioritize if you register somebody's face. If you're shooting a bunch of people, but you have one subject, you can actually register their face, which is cool. And then for focus magnifier, I do have this map, and I'll show you guys that. And then I like this set to four. So for manual focusing, you can punch in. And then we have peaking here. And then for the playback settings, I typically don't change any of that. I do sometimes connect to my smartphone and transfer uh, images over, typically pictures, not video. Um, so that's in there. 
And then in this little toolbox setting, there's definitely some things that I changed. So over here, the reset save settings, you can actually download all my custom settings and I'll leave a file in the video description to make it easier, especially for the custom button and function menus. Um, so that's how you load it in. And then below is where you actually customize your buttons. I'll be showing you that in just a second. And the next thing that I change, which is very important for me, is the display quality. So I'm gonna go in here, change it to high, and then viewfinder frame rate, I also want it set to high. Now, if you set it to standard, it's gonna save battery life, but man, I wanna see the sharpest image that I can see and with the least amount of, um, I don't know, late latency or delay or any of that kind of stuff. So. I'm gonna change that. And then jumping down over here, auto power off temperature. I'm setting this to high. It's gonna allow the camera to heat up hotter, but not shut off. I don't want it shutting off. So uh, the, if you set it to standard, it's gonna try to keep itself much cooler. And before it even gets warm, it'll wanna shut off on you. And then power start, save time. This I typically keep at five minutes um, because if I'm adjusting things, I move over to do audio, I don't want it to try to save power. And the batteries are so good in here. The battery life is excellent. Okay, let's go back down. Audio settings, I don't change. And I think all of this, I keep just the way it is out of the box. HDMI is automatic, which I'm using right now. And now let's take a look at how I set up all of my custom buttons for very fast and efficient shooting. You can have a different setting for photos and videos. I'm just gonna cover video. So right here at the start, we have this control dial or the control wheel. I use that for ISO. So I can have three separate wheels that I can quickly adjust. I have my aperture, my shutter speed, and my ISO. Number two, right here is for focus magnifier. So I can press that button and right away it just punches in if I'm manually focusing. The next one over controls autofocus and manual. Uh, there's some Sony lenses and these Tamron's that don't have an autofocus or manual focus switch. So I just press that button and I will toggle back and forth. And the one below that will toggle between face detection on or face detection off. So if I want to have find control and I don't want it focusing on faces, that is great. And then the one on the very left controls audio. So if I'm shooting, all I have to do is press that button and then I can use the touch screen or I can just go over and adjust my audio, which is great if you're recording sound internally. If you don't set that to that when you're recording, then you can't just jump into the menu to change that. And the last one on this page, I didn't change. And if you press on the little trash can button, it basically will turn off the touch screen, which can be handy. Now let's go into the second section. This is your little joystick. You can actually press into it and what I set that to is my focus area. So I'm gonna press down, and you guys can see it's switching between all my little focus points that I want. So wide, zone, center, spot. So as I'm adjusting it, if I need to go larger, bam, and you go a little bit larger, bam. It's very handy to have it set that way. The next one, which is the center button, is zoom, and this is for clear image zoom. So I can press in here, and I can do my 1.5 crop, which right now I'm on a wide lens, you don't see that much of a difference, but on a telephoto, it definitely makes a difference. The third one, which is pressing left, adjusts my monitor brightness so I can go between manual and sunny mode, which is great for outside. The fourth one is customizing my picture profile so I can quickly change into S-Log 3. It used to be two, now three, to get a, you know the best dynamic range from a shot. And then down below is white balance. At the top, I didn't change my record button, which they call a movie shooting button, but I did set the, the custom two to metering mode. So that allows me to quickly go through in between multi, which I use often, or I can use my spot metering and then right there with the joystick, I can move around. So we can see how much you know the exposure is. We're underexposed over here, overexposed here, and then probably proper, I don't know, somewhere here. And then for the last one, um, I don't have very many lenses that have the custom button on there, so I didn't change that at all. And now let's take a look at the function menu, which is the only menu that you can actually access while you are recording. So you wanna be very uh, particular about what you add here. Um, so this is great for something I don't use all the time. So you don't need to you know, add it to one of these custom buttons, but you still wanna have access to it as you're recording because you can't access the My menu 
menu um, or the regular menu while you're doing that. So on the left here, I have peaking. I can turn it on or off and adjust um, the level, which is great for, I have a couple manual lenses. I have zebras, same thing. Uh, autofocus transition speed. So as I'm recording, if I want to lower it down, if I'm doing a, a long gimbal take and I notice, hey, it's being a little funky, I can adjust that. I can adjust my auto white balance, what it's gonna prioritize. And then for my stabilization, I can turn it off if I'm on a gimbal or on a tripod. I can set it to standard if I want a wider aspect, like with this wide lens, or active, which crops in just a little bit, but that's the one that I would use if I want stabilization. Now going back here, I can change my recording media, card one, card slot one or two. Um, usually I have an auto switch if I'm recording and switching from one card to another, but sometimes you're getting close. You notice you only have five minutes left on one card. You don't want it to split the file for you. And you can just go in, bam, we're gonna switch to card slot two, and then it'll start recording on that one. Marker display, it's not working right now because I'm recording externally, but if I want to use my safety guides uh, or if I want my aspect ratios, it will pop up there. And then gamma assist, so it won't do anything right now because I'm not an S-log, but if shooting S-log, you want to see a sharper, more contrasty image to judge focus on, you can turn that on. And then for exposure mode, I'm in manual almost all the time, but if I need to do aperture priority or shutter, I can go through and change that but almost always in manual. So that is my function menu, very handy to have and be able to access. And then I'll show you guys lastly, the my menu. So this is stuff that I have to go, I can't map to um, the function menu, I can't map to the buttons, but I still wanna have quick access. And I only have two tiers here, you could do a bunch. So my menu one, file format, if I'm gonna switch to a different uh, format for HD, for example, you have to go down and change it there before you go into settings. Frame rates, if I want to do 60, 120, or 30, and then bit rates, you have access to that. If I want to format my media, if I want to go through and change and do backup recording, the aspect markers and the safety zone, I have a quicker way to find that. And then face priority and multimetering. If for some reason I want to use multimetering and then not go off of somebody's face if that's not what matters in that scene. I can switch that off. And then the second menu is just for face priority where you can register people's faces. So there you guys go. That's exactly how I set up my camera to work quickly, to be efficient, to give me everything that I need, especially while I'm recording to still have access to some important things. Once again, you guys can download the little file and, and put it into your camera to give you a nice starting point to work off of and then you guys can customize customize it for your needs. If you guys enjoyed this video, let me know down in the comments section below. Once again, a huge shout out to Storyblocks for sponsoring this video. They're very affordable with lots of great content. It's great for editors to have on hand. Thank you guys for watching. This has been Max and I'll see you in the next video.